Got to unmute my microphone. Hello, welcome everybody to uh, the first 2024 BMA webinar, Time is Money, Value Stream Capacity. Uh, for those of you who are um, on this, I apologize for all the technical difficulties. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. The first thing I want to do is the technical check um and please respond in the question panel can you see me can you hear me can you see the presentation all right great thanks for responding yeah that was uh very interesting on wednesday um i logged in or I tried to log in to go to webinar and it, it wouldn't let me log in. And I even, it was really, really strange. And uh, I did it many times. I restarted my computer and I thought it was on my end. And then uh, a few minutes before the webinar was supposed to start, I did look on the support page and it said there was an outage, which Probably about 30 minutes later, it was over uh, and everything was working, but I didn't want to try to start the webinar 30 minutes late. And then um, at first you receive the message, you can use the link because go to the go to webinar page still showed the webinar is a, a new webinar. And then somehow it changed it to a past webinar. And so I couldn't use that link anymore and I had to recreate the webinar. So that's why you got all those emails. So uh, for all of those, who, for those of you who are attending live, thank you. And then hopefully the rest of you will see this on the recording. So uh, technical check, or no, we did the technical check. Attendee administration. All right. So if you, um want the handout it's in the uh handout section of your control panel you can download it if you are if you forget to do that or if you are watching the recording of the webinar and you'd like a copy of the handout please send me an email and i'll um, send it to you and if you are a uh certified public accountant and would like continuing education credit for this and i can i can send you a certificate uh, all you have to do is stay on the webinar for 50 minutes answer three of the four polling questions which will come out and then i'll say just email me say you'd like a certificate and i'll get one to you and we'll go from there. Okay. So what do we want to accomplish today? First of all, to develop a good understanding of why measuring capacity is necessary in a lean management accounting system and a lean company. Understand different types of activities in lean companies. get a good understanding of which method of measuring capacity should be used in any process or value stream and understand the data collection <coughs> excuse me requirements to measure capacity so i'm going to sort of start out by talking a little bit about lean thinking and and dive into why capacity is important. But before I get started about that, I was um, waiting to start this webinar and I, I thought a little bit about how I learned about capacity. And when I first uh, got involved with lean accounting as a, cert, a CFO in a manufacturing company, we never really talked about capacity, but then when I met 
Brian Maskell and, and, and started working for him about 22 years ago, he and his uh, and Bruce Bagley, who is also retired, they worked very, very hard to develop a lot of what you're going to see. Um, I've taken it and made some changes over the years, but it's pretty much the, I, I wanted to give them credit for being able to to create a method to to calculate and quantify capacity and uh it's still it, it's it's a very important number in a lean management accounting system now you know some of you may work in companies that calculate capacity typically this is done in a very uh traditional way uh it could just be total total time uh a lot of times in manufacturing uh, using ERP systems, it will calculate capacity based on uh, like standard hours or machine hours or machine availability, things like that. So, you know, the, the word capacity is exists in companies. Um, this is a different way to measure and calculate it. And the primary reason that it's different is because of how lean companies and lean thinking in general views time. So easiest way to describe a lot of the different lean tools and practices is understanding what we are spending our time on. And, and Lean really works at developing a deep understanding of this. It's, 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 it's part of the fabric of Lean thinking, Lean tools, and Lean practices. <clears throat> and if you're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, any value stream, any process step, any activity, you can you there's three categories of how you can char 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 characterize or allot the time one is it can be value added this is the required necessary activities to produce a quality product to deliver a service or deliver information to a customer so yeah you have to perform these activities Okay, and it really relates to the quality of the product, the service, and the information. So, you know, uh, manufacturing a product, um, delivering delivering any kind of service, whether it's uh, you know some kind of professional service like legal, accounting. Uh, you could even look at it in terms of service industries you know, or restaurant. You can look at it also administrative activities for example what are the value added activities for month end close and accounting what are the value added activities in the uh, hiring process of a company then there are non value added but necessary activities so these are activities that don't create value but for some business reason they have to be performed Okay, they're think of them as a business necessity. And then the third type of activity, non value added and waste. So the, the wasteful activities, and you know, you can look at the acronym downtime, defect, uh, defects, overproduction, waiting time, neglect of human talent, transportation waste, uh, inventory waste motion waste, excess processing. Those are the other categories of activities and everything can be categorized in one of these three buckets. And it and it's really important. I mean, this goes on in a lot of lean practices, but what we're trying to do here with capacity is take 
what is very common and logical and lean and turn it into numbers to use to measure and calculate capacity. So when you think about continuous improvement, this is where there, there's this, we, I'm trying to build this linkage. So if you think about value added activities and, you, and you know, those are really related to serving the customers. Over time, through continuous improvement, you want to spend more time on those activities. The necessary non-value added activities, okay, those are for some business reason we have to do them. Inside those activities, there is waste. Okay, and so what you want to do is you want to find the waste in those business, in those necessary activities and lean them out. And then there's the unnecessary wasteful activities you want to reduce and eliminate. So, you know, everyone thinks about eliminating, eliminating the downtime waste, which is very apparent. But, you, you know, it's also very important to look at the necessary non-value added activities to see what goes on in there. Um, you know, for example, I'm working with a company right now and uh, they're in the process of put uh, getting ready to start a new ERP system at the end of uh, February. And one of the things that the new ERP system is going to do is eliminate the waste of having basically two bills of material. So I'm looking at a necessary non-value added uh, activity example, bills of material. Okay, you need a bill of material in a manufacturing company. It doesn't create any value for the customer having that bill of material, but it's necessary in the business. And so the current state of preparing bills of material is that there's a bill of material in their current ERP system. They also create an Excel-based bill of material, which has all the information from the ERP system, but then there's additional information in terms of things like work instructions and special instructions that cannot go into the ERP bill of material. So they, they have two bills of material. So every time they set up a new product, they have to set up two bills of material. And then you have to maintain both if there's any changes. So there's a lot of wasteful activities there. Now, with the new ERP system, one of the things that we configured in was one bill of material. And we work very hard with the people that do the bills of material and the ERP system to make sure that the information on the Excel bill of material that existing cell bill, existing bills of material in Excel are now being configured into the ERP system. So that's a long-winded example. So we have continuous improvement. And what does that lead to? Okay, when you make improvements and you lean out things. So you eliminate waste. You create capacity. You stop doing things. Okay. You, you do less wasteful activities. Uh, you eliminate stuff. So you're, you're creating more time. Okay. Now, from a lean accounting point of view, the issue is what do we do with that time? Now, if you don't measure it, you don't know. Intuitively, you may know you're creating time, but how do you actually put a measurement on any particular improvement activity? What did we get out of this? Okay, it's not always, for example, cost savings. It could just be creating capacity. So it depends on what you do with that time. For example, let's use 
of reducing the change over time on a machine. So let's say it goes from two hours to 15 minutes. So you pick up one hour and 45 minutes of capacity per changeover. What can you do with that capacity? Well, if there's demand, we can produce more on that machine and uh, ship the product, okay? So what's the financial impact of that? You know, in other cases, maybe not machine change over time. Well, yeah, let's think, but let's keep the machine change over time. Maybe that increase in capacity in that machine will allow us to uh, delay, postpone, or just you know not even consider having to buy a new machine. So then your machine costs as a percentage of sales goes down. That's cost reduction. So this is why it's important to measure capacity because how you use that capacity determines financial success. So let me show you some examples uh, relating continuous improvement to financial improvement. You know, basically any um, lean strategy has three objectives, serve customers better, improve process performance, respect for people. Now you might hear it a little bit differently, but that's pretty much what it is. So if you want to serve customers better, you focus on improving delivery, improving quality, and improving lead times. So if you improve delivery, the potential resulting financial improvement, if you're increasing capacity, is to increase sales without increasing costs. In terms of improving quality, you can increase sales, reduce material cost. Lead time. You can, with shorter lead times, serving customers better, increase sales without increasing costs. When it comes to improving material flow, you can increase the contribution margin, less material, improve cash flow, less inventory. Productivity and cost, if they're sort of related, you can reduce your fixed costs over time and productivity drives an increase in capacity. Safety and morale, even though they're focused on people, they go, you know, improving safety and improving morale goes a long way to managing costs. For example, uh, you know, there's there's financial, there's financial impact of, of accidents, you know, insurance rates, workers' comp rates, um, you know, there's morale you know, uh, having a better workplace environment and respecting your people, you know, it reduces turnover. And there's there's a great deal of savings there. So that's just an overview of lean thinking and why capacity is important. So let's do our first polling question. And I'm going to launch it. And I'm going to look to see if anybody has asked any questions. I don't see any at this time. You know, please, if you have a question, drop it in at any point. And I, during the polling questions, I can maybe get to some of those questions. All right, I'll give you about 10 more seconds to complete. All right, I'm going to close the poll. I'm not going to share the results. And let me just take care of things and I'll go to the process to measure capacity. Um, you know, like I said, over the years, I've worked with many companies and many types of industries to help them calculate and measure capacity. And what's what I found important is that you know you got to have a standard work. 
or I'm sorry, you have to have standard work, a process. And it's important for any company, wh whether you're working with me or doing it on your own, to have a standard method of measuring capacity. Now, this is going to be a new process, okay? So people have to learn how to do it. And if you know anything about standard work, you want to be able to document this, make sure that that you know if you have different different groups of people calculating capacity that they're calculating it similarly. okay? You don't want seven versions of capacity going around. The standard work also goes a long way towards uh, training and educating people on how to do it. So these are the basic steps of uh, calculating capacity. Now I'm going to go over each of these steps in a, a level of detail. So the source of the data, and you really have two choices. You can look at a specific process step, for example, in a value stream, or you can look at the the uh, capacity by sort of position or job or employee. Okay, so let me explain. Here's the here's the differences, and it's pretty logical. So process step. It's best to use when the value-added activities must be performed in a specific sequence. Think manufacturing, think of a product, okay? You have to, that, that, that product to be produced in the quality specifications can only be done one way. And it had, and, and the, the process of manufacturing and assembling has to be very specific. You have to do step one, step two, step three, step four. You can't do step three before step one, okay? And there's other processes like that. For example, um, any kind of a testing laboratory, you have to follow a specific sequence. So if that's the case, look at process step. Now, position or employee activities you, you, it's best to use those when the exact sequence of the value-added activities can vary. So this is typical in, for example, service industries, um, intangible product information, there's a typo there, it's productor, it says productor information, it should be product information. So you think about like healthcare, you think about accounting and administrative processes. Uh, you know, for example, in accounts payable, you know, there are specific steps that an invoice must follow from the time you receive the invoice to the time the invoice is paid, okay? But the people that work in accounts payable, they may not work in that specific sequence. They have specific, they will process invoices, maybe, you know, they they will do those steps, but not necessarily in a specific sequence where one invoice goes all the way through. Okay. Same thing is true in healthcare. I'm going to show you some examples of calculating both. So that's the first thing to do is to decide this. Then you have to decide where to measure. You can measure all the steps in the value stream, or you can just measure the bottleneck. Again, this is a choice. If you have a simple value stream in manufacturing or service or administrative, you can do all the process steps. If you have a complex value stream, you may want to look at the bottleneck process step. Okay, so the bottleneck process step this is, this is the process step that has the longest processing time or cycle time. The reason you can calculate the bottleneck is because it controls the rate of flow through, through the entire value stream. 
and maybe you ha you might have maybe a, a couple bottlenecks depending on what you're working on in a particular value stream so calculate both okay so it's a choice what i'm the reason i'm saying this is you know in in some complex manufacturing value streams you may have like uh, 20 or 30 steps to produce a product and you know that's a lot of data to collect and calculate and manage so identify activities by type okay and we talked about this earlier value added non-value added non-value added and waste or sorry non-value added necessary non-value added and waste have a very strict lean definition okay and if you're not sure about the activities or you haven't done a, a process map do a direct observation to determine don't simply ask people because if people that work in a process are not familiar with this type of thinking there's a tendency that they think everything is value added now they may be able to identify waste for example defects or excess processing but it's that necessary piece okay that can be confusing collect the data now the idea behind data collection it's a periodic time study i'm going to show you some examples in a little while but here's the basic information you need to collect what is the total capacity so this is the number of people or, or machines multiplied multiplied by the hours work per day multiplied by the days per month so that's total and and what you'll see is that um, the recommended time frame for measuring capacity is an average month then you look at every single activity in whatever the value stream and you measure the average time to complete that activity activity frequency how many times does this activity occur in a typical month so where do you get the data if you have good value stream maps or process maps with data boxes it already has this information the people that have um, done the value stream maps have gone through the process of getting this information use use it off the value stream maps if you don't have the value stream maps you need to do so you could do the map if you want you can also just do direct observation um, you know i recommend the samples a good sample size is 30 observations so if you have a high volume process it doesn't take long to get this now if you have a long process long cycle times or it doesn't occur that frequently do the best you can okay now I, I recommend direct observation and not ask people okay because if you ask people how long does it take they they're they they might give you the best possible time they might give you the worst possible time they you ask two people who do the same thing they may give you different numbers okay direct observation and as I mentioned, the idea is what is the average capacity in a month? Okay, we don't want to look at the highs and the lows. Then you simply calculate the capacity, and you're going to have three buckets. You're going to have productive capacity, which is the total time spent on the value added activities, you have non productive which is the total time spent on non-value added activities, both necessary and wasteful. And then you'll have available capacity, which is the total time created through improvement. All right, so that's the method to calculate capacity. I get asked this a lot, how often do we update it? 
So you have your current state, which is what you just calculated based on following those steps. You have to think about your continuous improvement cycles and how many improvement events, because continuous improvement, for as we saw when I explained the economics of lean, you know, most improvement events create a level of capacity. So depending on the, the volume and frequency of continuous improvement events, that sort of dictates how often you should update capacity. You can do it periodically, for example, once a quarter, maybe once a month if you have a lot of improvement activities going on, or maybe just after major Kaizen events. Again, you're gonna have, you have to sort of think this out. There's no hard, fast way, but it needs to be updated to what is like the new current state, new, new average capacity. All right, so let's do polling question number two. And I wanna see. Okay, so there was one question, Eric asked me, what about the most costly step versus the bottleneck? Uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, it, the only difficulty there is uh, how do you define the most costly step without going through a uh, a, a big allocation of cost. That's that's my only thing right there. That, but it's it, it's interesting. All right, so let me uh, close the poll. Not going to share the results. And go back to the presentation. So th there's there's the lean thinking behind measuring capacity, and the lean accounting reasons. There's the process. So what I want to do is run through some calculations. Okay, uh, I always found, or I found over time that uh, one of the easiest ways for people to learn how to calculate capacity is by looking at seeing the numbers and seeing how the calculations work. So I'm going to show you two methods, both methods, the position method and the process step method. So first, we're going to do the position method. Uh, and this is an example of calculating the capacity of a team of nurses in the inpatient wing of a hospital. OK? So I'm going to put the numbers up, show you the numbers, and we'll talk through them. So step one, what's the total available time or total capacity? So what we're doing here is we are looking at the first shift of nurses. So on any first shift, there are four nurses on duty. They work an eight hour shift and 30 days per month. Now there's more than four nurses on staff, but you know, the same four nurses are not working 30 days, okay? So you have four on staff, eight hours a day, 30 days, you have 57,600 minutes available. Typically, you wanna, your time factor, your time is gonna be minutes or seconds. In, in manufacturing, you might have seconds if you have high volume manufacturing. But that's one thing you have to decide too. So we have 57,600 minutes in an average month. So what are we spending our time? What are they spending their time on? Well, you have to do a time study. You have to do some observations. So, you know, and rather than show you all the activities, I'm going to break it down uh, because we have a time limit on the webinar. So what are the value-added activities? So if you think about a nurse, what are the activities that nurses perform that are required <coughs> to the pay who are required for the, the patient plan of care? 
So there's, they have to do their rounds and they do check-ins. How is the patient doing? They actually do some treatments. They also have to update the records because what I learned working in a hospital um, in terms of helping them with lean is, you know, you, you have to record when treatments are done, when, you know, when specific things are done. So, so the plan of care is, is kept and other people can look at it. So we have 450 rounds per month. They take, each round takes about 20 minutes. There's 300 treatments per month. Each one takes about 30 minutes. Updating records, 150 per month, 15 minutes per update. Calculate that out, 20,250 minutes of value added time, which is 35% of the total capacity, total available time. You know, and you know, it, so you have to look at, you know, you're looking at the what the per, person does or what the position does, but you also have to look at the work. For example, you know, in accounts payable or in administrative process, what what is the what are the activities that that position performs that is related to the process and and moving either the the information or cert or providing the service that's basically necessary. Then there's calculating the non-productive necessary time. And again, you have to have a, a good strict definition of this. So in the case of the nurses, they have to do intake. Patients come in, that happens 150 times a month, takes about 30 minutes. They have to room the patients. Again, 150 patients a month come in. On average, takes 30 minutes to room them. Then there's the discharge process that takes 60 minutes and happens about 125 times a month. And then there's the coding, which again is part of the medical records that takes 15 minutes and that it's done about 150 times a month. So these are necessary business activities that relate to healthcare that have to be performed by the nurse. You can't, you, you can't stop doing them. Okay, but you know, you see it's 18,750 minutes, 33%. But what you can do as part of improvement activities, for example, like discharge, why does it take 60 minutes to discharge a patient? Are there wasteful activities in there that maybe we can reduce the time? Maybe we can get it down to 30 minutes. We're creating some capacity and we're performing the discharge function in a leaner way. Then finally, there's the non-productive wasteful time. Searching for supplies takes 15 minutes per search, done 360 times. There's messages, there's phone calls, there's meetings. You can see how on average, how long it takes to do each. You, again, do the math, 21% <coughs> non-productive capacity. And then you summarize this. You have productive capacity, 35%, necessary, 33%, non-productive, 21%. You do the subtraction, whether you subtract the numbers or the percentages, and you get 11% available capacity. You will have available capacity even in the current state. That's It's not designed to be zero, okay? Um, you know, but every process on average has some capacity. If you don't have capacity in a process, then you know you you you're not getting work done, or the only way you get the work done is by people working a whole lot of overtime. So that's the way you calculate capacity by position. Like I said, this can be done in healthcare, can be done in administrative processes service processes, service companies. So let's do the third polling question.
All right. So uh, lots of questions. Um, one question, which Alessandro uh, wrote, you know, couldn't the exercise of calculating capacity on activities create a sense of false precision? Well, uh, I, possibly. Um, like I said, we're trying to just get an average. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. We're we're trying to get a, a, a an average. Okay, we're not trying to be precise to the minute or to the second. I mean, when you do a bit, the history behind calculating capacity in uh, BMA with Brian and Bruce is they started using value stream map information. And if you've been involved in value stream mapping activities, you know that, um, again, it's a, it's a, time study you go out there and you do a periodic time study you don't spend months doing it because you want to get the map done so um <clears throat> it's important for people to understand why this information is needed and how to get it in a reasonable fashion all right so let me just get a sip of water Now let's look at the uh, capacity by process step and a manufacturing example. So first, total time per month. Now you can <coughs> do people or machines. You have you, what you want to look at is what resource is doing the value added work. Okay. Now in a value stream, you may have people doing it in one process step or in one cell machines doing it in a different cell so again if you're doing the whole value stream look at each cell what resource is doing the work if you're doing the bottleneck what resource is doing the work in this example it's people so very similar how much total average time do we have number of people number of shifts and that's the typical number of shifts so if you only run one shift you only Calculate it on one shift. You don't calculate it assuming you can add a second or third shift. And, uh, you know, how many days in the month? Back out time when the resource is not working, lunch and break. So in this example, you get 126,000 minutes. Then you go into the productive time. The productive time is how many units are produced and shipped. In this case, 4,875. <clears throat> you see there's units produced 5,000. So there's a bit of overproduction, which is going to show up on the non-productive side. What's the average cycle time per unit? 10 minutes. So we get 48,750 minutes, 39% of 126,000. So what are some of the variations here? number of units shipped got to get an average now in some cases especially in manufacturing you have lots of different units going through a value stream you know uh use the 80 20 rule that 20 percent of the products are 80 percent of the volume and just get that average in terms of units shipped and cycle time or you can take some kind of sample okay but you have to go through this, uh, you know, to, you have to make some like rational decisions about how to get it. Again, this goes back to the whole precision thing. You know, it would be a very long time study to observe every product going through a value stream and, you know, how many units and what is the cycle time. Then you calculate the non-productive and waste time. So in manufacturing, that's going to be changeover time. So what's the typical batch size? How long is the average changeover time? 500 is the batch size, 60 minutes per changeover, 750 total minutes of changeover time. There's the overproduction. 
125 units, takes 10 minutes to produce that unit. Total overproduction time is 1,250 minutes. How about scrap and rework? What's your average scrap rework, rework rate? In this case, it's 20%. That means 1,250 units are scrapped, and that's 12,500 minutes. Percentage of items inspected, okay? 30%, 6,250 items are made. That includes the ones that are eventually scrapped. Five minutes per inspection time, 9,375 minutes. And then there's downtime, 20%, 20% of 126,000 minutes, 25,200 minutes. So in essence, what you've done here, and the same thing is true in the nurse example, is, is all the wasteful activities, you now have, you understand them in the sort of common denominator of time. How much time are we spending on the wasteful activities? What this, one of the benefits of calculating a current state capacity, it can help possibly drive improvement activities. And what I mean by that is when you do an improvement activity or when you're trying to plan your activity, you're trying to get what I call the best return on effort. So if we spend three days on a Kaizen event, for example, and we're taking a team of people, or, you know, they're not going to do their regular work, they're going to be on this event, what's the best return on their effort? So in this case, you know, you'd look at maybe, well, if we can reduce downtime, we, we, by 10%, we pick up a lot of time. You think, look at change over time, you know, you, you got 750 minutes, so you, you'll pick up some time, but, you know, where's the best return on effort? If you work on scrap and defect and quality, there's also a, 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 a double bang bang for the effort, you reduce the scrap rate, you might reduce the inspection rate. Then you calculate the non-productive necessary time. So, you know, in, in a lean operation, you have 5S activities, okay? 10 minutes per day and all 15 people do that. You have daily huddles, again, another 10 minutes per day. And so when you add everything in step three and step four together, you get 55,075 minutes, that's 44%. And in this example, they also broke out continuous improvement time. So on average, every person spends about eight hours per month on continuous improvement, which is 6% of the 126,000. And again, you do the math, and you see that on average you have 12% uh, available capacity. You can subtract the the minutes from 126,000, or you can subtract the percentages from 100. And so that's the way you calculate capacity by process step. So let's do the last polling question. So while I'm doing the poll, uh, somebody asked, can we use OEE numbers for step three? Uh, yeah, possibly. I, I've had a few companies that, that that's how they, uh, that's what they preferred to do in terms of it. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between that capacity, my, the capacity calculator I showed and, and the typical OEE. Um, and then uh, Eric, you know, said, seems like a, a max average and minimum capacity would be interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, that 
I like what you said here is it gets management attention. And, you know, that, that's the thing. I'm going to close the poll. Um, that's the thing about turning this concept of capacity into numbers that are related to lean. It is very, very revealing. And, you know, it, it, it does get people to focus on what is important. One other question before I wrap up, um, Dominique asked, you know, does, does the cycle time include waste time? No, the, the, think of the cycle time in the, the process step example as that, that's just the touch time. You know, some, some companies call it cycle time, some companies call it the process time, but it, in manufacturing, it's just the activities that are required to change the form, fit, or function. All right, so let's wrap up and then we'll look at a few more questions. All right, so uh, the wrap up here is about just, you know, how do you use this? So here's, here's a simple example. Company is planning to make improvements, on-time delivery, quality, first time through and, and reducing inventory, doc to doc days, okay? You can calculate what the operational impact is. You can also calculate the direct financial impact with a value stream income statement. And if you look, you know, the, the, the direct financial impact is the reduction in material costs because you have less inventory and less scrap. But when you can calculate capacity, you can really see what you're getting out of these improvement events. And in general, you're doubling the available capacity. The employee capacity goes from 19% to 37%. The machine capacity goes from 15 to 29%. So now you have a very clear objective measure of what are we getting out of these events or what did we get out of these events? Then the question becomes, what do we do with that capacity? And, and this is where the, you can leverage lean for tremendous financial improvement. So in this case, there were three options. You could transfer people out. That's the remove unneeded. And you can see that would reduce the conversion costs. You can see what it does to the available capacity. You can increase sales, and you can see the impact on increasing sales, keeping the conversion costs basically the same, and improving profitability. The other option was insourcing some uh, pro production process that was previously outsourced, where you reduce the material cost. So now you can really see the true relationships between improvement, capacity, and financial performance. Another example is labor and managing labor costs, which is very important in companies, but when you start looking at it in terms from a lean viewpoint and a lean accounting viewpoint, you, you stop thinking about reducing headcount. We just got to get rid of people. And you think about, what are we doing with the capacity we're creating? So if you focus on improving productivity and you create labor capacity, what do we do with it? Well, you know, one way to reduce costs, decrease overtime. Don't replace people, okay? Uh, you know, and I'm, when I talk about that, I'm talking about natural attrition, okay? And if you have a measure of capacity, and you know what the available capacity is, you should be able to understand if we lose one person, what does that do to our available capacity? You know, do we still have, it goes down, but we still might have enough capacity to meet demand. You can also do strategic redeployment, the previous example. 
the capacity, the, the value stream that did the improvement had available capacity and you were able to, uh, they were able to transfer some people to another value stream that needed capacity. And again, if you're making these decisions, especially when it comes to labor, you know, you want you want to have the numbers. You want to, don't want to do this with um, tribal knowledge. You don't want to make false assumptions. What's the goal? Reduce labor costs as a percentage of sales. The benefits of measuring capacity. You can measure the impact of one or a series of improvement events. Have those, if you have those capacity numbers, that helps you drive costs down. You can calculate the actual profitability of decisions. You know, for example, if you have available capacity and you have an opportunity to sell more, the financial impact is there's an increase in sales. If, if it's manufacturing, there's an increase in variable costs and an increase in contribution margin. There's no change in fixed costs. You can calculate when to add people, when to add equipment. And it also is very helpful in uh, planning, whether it's strategy deployment or any kind of sort of long-term forecasting of when, how much capacity will be created over the course of a year with our planned events or if our demand is um, it going up, when will we have to add capacity? So that wraps things up. And uh, just a couple things, you know, there's the lean accounting certification programs, one for lean management accounting, one for lean accounting process improvement. Each of these certifications, it's five one hour classes, they're online, on-demand, self-paced. Okay, there's some pricing. If you go to the uh, web page, you'll get more information. You have more information. If you have any questions, ask me. I also offer group pricing. Okay, both for the for both of them. I showed to you capacity calculations. The capacity calculator templates are in what on the web page that where you can download the free lean accounting toolkit and you can use on your own there's upcoming bma webinars okay there's one on february 21st on value streams and march the end of march uh planning a lean management accounting transformation and then as we get closer to march i'll be adding more webinars for the second quarter and you know if you have any um suggestions on future webinars one it's uh in the survey but you can always uh, just send me an email say you know have you ever thought about this and also on our uh, website there's a link to all the recorded webinars that go there's about maybe about 30 of them all right, so um, I'm just looking at the questions. All right, didn't have any other questions. So uh, thanks for attending. Hope you learned something. Do you have any questions? Please contact me. And also remember, if you want any kind of certificate, to send me an email and I'll get you that certificate. You will be receiving an email in about three hours with a link to the recording. And please feel free to share it with anyone that you want and the link never expires. Thanks a lot, have a good day and see you in a few weeks at our next webinar. Bye-bye.